In the world of wines, you have different categories. You got the normal wine, you got the premium wine, you got the super premium wine, then you got the icons. But what above the icons? Above the icons, you have the legends, the myth, the wines that everybody dreams about and sometimes never drink in their own life. Among these myths, among these legends, in sweet wines, we probably limit the group to wines that have been produced from, at least documented, since the 18th century. It's Tokai, meant Essencias and uh, Six Putunios, Five Putunios wine are legendary. You have the Chateau d'Iquem in Sauterne, and you have the Vin de Constance in South Africa. Uh, Vin de Constance in modern days is produced by Clan Constantia. It's a Muscat de Frontignan, uh, Muscat with small berries, uh, produced in a natural sweet wine style. But let me remind you what, how we produce sweet wines. To produce sweet wines, we need to concentrate the juice so much that there's excess sugar to be left unfermented making sweet wine. We never add sugar to a sweet wine. The different ways to do it is, okay, we have ice vine, which is freezing the berries so only the sugar goes out. You have the straw wine or pasito, which means drying uh, in the normal air, uh, drying the berries until they shrivel and concentrate the sugar and the acidity. We have the botrytis wine, which we call noble late harvest. It's a fungus that grows on the surface of the skin of the berry, allows the water to evaporate quickly, therefore concentrating again the sugar and uh, the acidity and the flavors. The other option is to fortify the wine by adding alcohol, which means then you stop the fermentation. But this is not what we're talking about today. Today, Vin de Constance is a natural sweet wine, meaning you overripe the, the grapes, the berries, on the vine, letting them slowly dehydrate. Uh, they, you'll see, they'll, they'll shrink, they'll be more concentrated, leaving a nectar pure sweetness of concentrated sugar and freshness and uh, density, palate weight, everything you need for a great sweet wine. The Constantia wine estates goes back to 1685, which is very, you know, long time ago in history. But it's about 100 years later that Vin de Constance became a global icon already. You can find Vin de Constance uh, drunk by Frederick of Prussia, you can find Vin de Constance drunk by George Washington, by John Adams, a US president, you will find Vin de Constance in the literature of Casanova or Alexandre Dumas, the French author, and in modern days uh, Queen Elizabeth II and Nelson Mandela and even the Chinese president are big fans of the Vin de Constance. So in the history of Vin de Constance, what have changed and what made Vin de Constance so important in the history of wine? But rather ask Matt, what is Vin de Constance? He's a winemaker of Clan Constantia, so it's the best to talk about modern Vin de Constance. So what has changed since the old days with Vin de Constance? And a lot has actually changed. Um, the wine is very similar, but it's completely different in terms of style um, today. So just to chat a little bit about the old days. So, I mean, the farm was founded in 1685. The most important person then was Simon van der Stel. He founded the property, he was the governor of the Cape. Um, that's a great story. We've also got great stories about who used to drink it. Um, and we talk about all these stories, but it's more important that we talk about the future of Clank and Stanger and who's drinking van der Constant today. Um, but to go into the old stories, I mean, it was Jane Austen, it was Charles Dickens, it was Napoleon and all these guys, um, and his incredible story. Uh, uh, but just to go into a little bit of the winemaking, uh, what has changed? So we always talk about um, Hendrik Kluti being the guy that started making the sweet wine of Constantia and it's in all of our history books and it's, it's a lot of the research is, it revolves around that. But recently we've done some research into the history and there's a guy called Johannes Kalein that was very instrumental in getting this wine to what it is today. Um, Johannes Kalein, literally, some of the things that he did, we, we're still using today at Klein Constantia, um, just in a different way. And one of them was, he would literally take leaves and he would wrap them around the vine and tie it up with string, and they would stop the bugs 
um, from climbing up to the stems. We do the same thing today. We wrap cotton wool around the vine. It's a very organic way of doing it, which is great. He also spoke about, I always speak about the only reason why this wine became successful in the old days is because of the sugar, formed a preservative, and they didn't have the same understanding of science and technology that we do today. So normal wines would have gone completely off. And because of the sugar, it meant it could last the voyage all the way back to Europe and all these great people could drink it. Um, and I always said that, but it was actually in Johannes Kunlein's uh, journals, he spoke about adding sulfur and he had this really good understanding of preserving the wine and keeping it solid and all the rest. So we've learned a lot from that. Uh, the cultivars in the old days would have been Semillon, it would have been Pontac, it would have been Chenin Blanc, and it would have been Muscat de Today we've now implemented 100% Muscat de purely because that works for the style that we're making of Van der Constance today. So saying that Muscat's got very thick skins and it raisins very easily. Uh, it doesn't get botrytis on it, and that's what we want. So the natural raisining, that's what we're looking for, and that's what makes it unique. So we've gone out and we've replanted Muscat de Francinan since 1986. Um, and today we're actually playing around with some other cultivars. I mean, we've got uh, Petit Malsang, that we're come, which will be coming into production soon. We've got Harsh Levelu, we've got Shannon, and we've got Ferment, purely as experimental tools to make this great wine better. So that's the long story short. A lot has changed, but not a lot has changed in terms of the wine itself. I've been fortunate enough to taste a couple of the old vintages. Um, so we, I've had the, sure, it was the 1821, which is a beautiful wine. It's still perfect to this day. Uh, and that's, as I say, because of the sugar and you know, the understanding of preserving it um, that kept it for all these years. And recently we've opened two bottles of 1885, which would have been some of the last vintages ever made in Constantia. Vin de Constance is definitely a wine full of history. And one of the legends still floating around these days is that Napoleon Bonaparte, the French emperor, when he was captured after Waterloo, was sent to St. Helena Islands. And still he was offered some benefits of a war prisoner. He could choose some of his wine. One of the wine he chose was Vin de Constance. It was his favorite wine and it was uh, delivered in a small barrel that was reserved for the emperor. Uh, people say that the British have been poisoning the Vin de Constance to kill Napoleon Bonaparte, but he loved so, the wine so much that maybe that was the way to give him a happy death. Anyway, it's only a legend and you can drink Vin de Constance these days without any risk, but with moderation. Um, uh, Matt, what do you expect when you drink a Vin de Constance from Klein Constantia these days? What people should find in the glass, what does it taste like? What you would, sm what you would expect from Van der Constant in terms of, of flavor is a very unique characteristic. It is not typical, as I say, with botrytis. It's got a very intense kind of Turkish delight, raisined, dried apricot, uh, dried apricot, um, almonds, uh, raisiny kind of character. It's very perfumed, it's very aromatic. And then when you taste it, when you get the intensity on the palate, it's, this is what makes us special. And this is one of my reasons for Van der Constance being one of the great sweet wines of the world, is we're aiming for a sweet wine that almost doesn't taste sweet on the palate. And that's pure, purely due to the balance, the balance between sugar, alcohol, and acidity. You get that sugar, which brings out flavor, but you've got the acidity to back it up and balance it out and it is very dry on the finish, together with a really good, kind of a marmy, kind of spicy, savory characteristic to it as well. So in terms of winemaking, just to explain the way that we do it, um, to back this up that it's unique, is the winemaking of this is, our harvest is literally three months in some vintages. It's about 25 different batches. We start picking at the end of January, which is literally the same time that we start picking our Method Cup Classique um, grapes. So very high in acidity. Then we pick throughout the season and we're looking for those perfect raisins. Um, so we start off with 20% raisins, go riper, 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 to the point that we've got a specialized team that literally go out and pick individual raisins from every single bunch. And they've got a little bucket on their belt and they do one kilogram to five kilograms per person per day. And that forms the heart and soul of Van der Constance. 
from those 25 different batches and the raisins, each and every single different batch is made in a different way. So we do two weeks skin contact, we ferment on the skins, we press straight away, we soak it on the raisins, we do anything and everything to this wine. Uh, fermentation is then three months to a year, um, which is crazy. It's just a very slow trickle away at fermentation. And then we blend it to get that perfect con uh, combination between alcohol, sugar and acidity. It's then three and a half years in barrel before a six month process of literally blending that perfect component together to make the perfect blend. Some of the very last vintages of the old sweet wine of Constantia to record were roughly the 1885 vintages. And a lot happened between 1885 and 1986 at Clan Constantia. And everyone always blames Phylloxera for destroying the vines of South Africa and most of the world. Um, but we've got a couple of other reasons for the demise of the, the winemaking. Uh, the most important reason was mildew, um, oedium in the vineyards. Then it was Phylloxera. Then it was the English starting their free trade agreement with the French. Um, and the English obviously took over the colony of the Cape from the Dutch, uh, and we then didn't have a market to sell wine. Um, and the last one was actually the abolishment of slavery, so it became very expensive to make wine. So the whole of the South African wine industry almost folded. So Clank and Sancho was bought in 1980 um, for a million rand, which is next to nothing as we think of it today. Um, the first vines were then planted in, in 1982 um, and 1983 for the first vintage to be 1986. Um, and that vintage was actually never sold, which was an incredible story. They, they literally just sent it out to, to the right people in, in the wine industry to taste, and it created a following, and then the 1987 was the first vintage on the market. Cheers, enjoy. <laughs> there is no wine more famous from South Africa than Vin de Constance, because history gives this Vin de Constance a legitimacy like very few wines have in the world. To remind the wine lovers that Vin de Constance is a specific history, it comes in a specific bottle, like a hand and mouth blown bottles that could be found in the 18th and 19th century. I mean, I had the chance to taste 1821 like Matt, and this wine was so fresh and beautiful and intense. So. These are 500 milliliter bottles. It's bigger than half bottles, more than normal bottles. It comes out as well in magnums for collectors. But if you have the chance, wherever you are in the world, to taste this concentrated muscat, Vano Constance is unique. It's uh, something that any wine lover has to have tasted once in their life. And I wish it will be your turn soon. Thank you so much.